Hi, I'm Dr. Kim Hunter-Reed, Louisiana's Commissioner of Higher Education. During the 2021 regular legislative session, several new laws were passed to help keep our campus communities safe from incidents of power-based violence. We have collaborated with national experts, as well as state experts and critical stakeholders to create this mandatory training for responsible employees at colleges and universities across our state. Our goal is to improve the culture, education, and prevention so that our campuses are safer and we look out for each other. This training will also educate all higher education employees on what power-based violence is, how to support students in the event of a disclosure of power-based violence, the responsibility of employees to report, and the consequences of failing to report incidents of power-based violence as well. Together, we can ensure Louisiana provides safe campuses that allow our students to learn, grow, and graduate. We appreciate your commitment to the safety of our students and to our campus communities. Hello, and thank you for watching this training module offered by the Louisiana Board of Regents, Reporting Power-Based Violence, What Employees Need to Know. I'm Nina Gupta, an attorney who specializes in representing colleges and universities, and I'll be taking you through today's training module. Since you're an employee of a public college or university in Louisiana, it's important that you're familiar with your obligations under the law with respect to power-based violence. What power-based violence is, who constitutes a responsible employee, who is responsible for reporting power-based violence, and how to report it. By the end of this module, you should have a good understanding of these concepts. The Louisiana Board of Regents has partnered in this work with other organizations, developing this training in coordination with the Office of the Louisiana Attorney General and in consultation with the Louisiana Foundation Against Sexual Assault. We thank them for their thought partnership in these efforts. During this module, you will encounter a series of quizzes to check your understanding of each concept covered in each section. You will need to answer all quiz questions, and if you get a question wrong, you'll need to review the relevant section before proceeding to the next section and completing your training. So please pay close attention. Additionally, there are written materials accompanying this module. You'll be able to access these written materials after you complete the module, and you can keep them as a reference guide. Before we get started, we want to offer a trigger warning. This training will discuss sexual violence, various forms of sexual assault and trauma. These topics can be difficult to contemplate and may cause discomfort or distress. Please do what you need to do to take care of yourself during and after this presentation. First, let's discuss how we got here. This past year or so, there has been an increased publicity and awareness around sexual assault, as well as failures to intervene and respond on Louisiana campuses. The state legislature held hearings in 2021 and heard from survivors of sexual violence. Their testimony was searing and compelling, highlighting not only the trauma that sexual violence causes, but the gaps and missed opportunities in appropriately responding to it. As a result of these and other efforts, the state legislature passed far-reaching legislation aimed at preventing and responding to power-based violence on Louisiana campuses. This legislation defines what power-based violence is and adopts individual and institutional reporting obligations. Ultimately, this legislation seeks to promote a culture of safety that supports all students by seeking to intervene when students experience power-based violence, a culture of not sweeping things under the rug, a culture of active prevention and active intervention. The legislation also requires training for employees of all public colleges and universities. One such training requirement is for quote unquote responsible employees developed in conjunction with the Office of Louisiana Attorney General and in consultation with state or local victim service organizations. This is the training that you're watching. So what is power-based violence? It's a term that is much broader than sexual assault or sexual misconduct and broader than the definition of sexual harassment under Title IX that you might already be familiar with. Power-based violence focuses on power differentials and the abuse of that power, rather than sex or gender. Anyone, student or employee, can be a perpetrator of power-based violence, and anyone, student or employee, can experience it. 
As we discuss power-based violence and your role as a responsible employee, remember that these laws protect student and employees from power-based violence and aim to create a culture of safety for all. One important note to keep in mind as you go through this training module, your ultimate responsibility is to report power-based violence. Specifically, you must report power-based violence if it is committed by a student or committed against a student. So if the alleged victim is a student, regardless of who the perpetrator is, even if it's another student or staff or faculty member, you must report it. Likewise, if a student allegedly commits power-based violence, whether it is committed against another student or staff or faculty member, you must report it. We will discuss this in more detail later in the module. Power-based violence is defined as any form of interpersonal violence intended to control or intimidate another person through the assertion of power over that person. As you can see, this is a broad definition. The law does list some specific examples that we will review, but please remember that this list of examples is not exhaustive. Power-based violence includes dating violence, which includes physical or sexual abuse within a dating relationship. It also includes domestic and family abuse, which includes any physical or sexual abuse between family or household members, as well as threatening a family or household member with the intention of preventing them from seeking assistance or preventing them from leaving an abusive relationship. Power-based violence also includes non-consensual observation of another sexuality, including voyeurism, peeping Tom activities, or non-consensual disclosure of a private image, sometimes referred to as quote-unquote revenge porn. Next, power-based violence includes all forms of sexual assault. The Louisiana Criminal Code defines sexual assault to include rape, statutory rape, sexual battery, female genital mutilation, intentional exposure to HIV, and incest. It also includes sexual exploitation, such as forcing someone into prostitution or forcing someone into making pornography. Power-based violence also includes sexual harassment, defined as unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal, physical, or inappropriate conduct of a sexual nature when that conduct explicitly or implicitly affects an individual's employment or education, unreasonably interferes with an individual's work or educational performance, or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work or educational environment and has no legitimate relationship to the subject matter of a course or academic research. Please note that this definition of sexual harassment differs from and is broader than the definition of sexual harassment under Title IX. Power-based violence includes stalking and cyber-stalking, as well as unlawful communications. For example, following someone, repeatedly showing up at their home uninvited, sending threatening or harassing emails or texts, making repeated phone calls with the intent of abusing or harassing another are all examples of stalking, cyber-stalking, or unlawful communications that would constitute power-based violence. Finally, the definition of power-based violence includes a catch-all category of unwelcome sexual or sex or gender-based conduct that is objectively offensive, has a discriminatory intent, and lacks a bona fide academic purpose. Remember that all the examples that we went through are just that, examples. They are not an exhaustive list of instances or types of power-based violence. Remember also the overarching definition of power-based violence, which is any form of interpersonal violence intended to control or intimidate another person through the assertion of power over the person. A power differential is necessary, as is the intent to control or intimidate that person through the assertion of that power. And while many examples of power-based violence do focus on sex and gender-based conduct, many examples do not. Power-based violence, as the name implies, focuses on power differentials. Those power differentials might be based on sex or gender, but they don't have to be. We know that power differentials exist along many planes and across many kinds of relationships. For instance, 
A supervisor has power over a subordinate employee. A religious leader has power over members of a religious organization. A well-known public figure may have power over others by virtue of their social capital. Also keep in mind that although the term is quote unquote power-based violence, actual physical violence is not necessary for an incident to constitute power-based violence. For example, engaging in peeping Tom activities can constitute power-based violence even though there is no physical contact between the parties. Similarly, harassing someone through repeated and unwanted text can be considered power-based violence. Also central to any discussion of power-based violence is the concept of consent. Not every interaction between people with different levels of power is necessarily exploitative or an example of power-based violence. Consent is key. Independent, unimpaired adults have the power and right to consent to things that you and I might not understand or might not agree to in the same position. But again, consent is the key. So what is consent? Our state law does not define consent, but the dictionary does. Consent can be a verb, meaning to give assent or approval. For example, I consent to participating in a personal relationship with another person. Consent is also a noun, meaning compliance in or approval of or agreement as to action. For example, I give my consent to undergoing a medical procedure. It is essential to understand that there are some assumptions built in here. Consent is voluntary rather than coerced. It is knowing, meaning that the person giving consent understands what they are consenting to, and it is given by someone with the capacity to give it. When consent is present, power-based violence is not. When consent is absent, there is the potential for power-based violence. When we consider consent in the context of sexual activity, consent must exist from beginning to end. People have the right to change their minds in the middle of an encounter. Consent is demonstrated through mutually understandable words and or actions that clearly indicate a willingness to engage in sexual activity. While consent may be expressed with words or by actions alone, nonverbal actions can be misinterpreted creating the possibility for confusion and misunderstandings. In the worst case scenario, this can result in a sexual assault. When we consider consent, especially in the context of college and university campuses, we must also consider alcohol and drugs. Alcohol and drugs impair judgment and can reduce or eliminate entirely the capacity to give consent. What does this mean? It means that engaging in sexual activity with an individual who is too impaired to give consent can constitute power-based violence. But remember, alcohol and drugs are tools of assault, not the cause. An individual is not sexually assaulted because they were drunk. An individual is sexually assaulted because a perpetrator committed an assault. Now that we've discussed what power-based violence is, it's time for our first round of quizzes. In this section, you'll be given four short scenarios and asked to determine whether each scenario constitutes power-based violence. Each is a yes-no question. Use your mouse to select what you believe is the correct answer. After each scenario, you'll hear the correct answer. If you get any of these four questions wrong, you will need to rewatch the section discussing power-based violence before proceeding with the training module. Good luck. Number one, in our first scenario, the captain of the women's basketball team is upset with the junior player's performance and thinks she should be kicked off the team. The captain convinces several other players to inundate the junior player with obscene texts and images in the hopes of forcing her to quit the team. Is this power-based violence? Yes, this is power-based violence. The team captain is in a position of power and authority over her teammates, and she used that power to harass and convince others to harass a junior player in order to coerce her into quitting the team. In our second scenario, two students, Alex and Sam, were dating for a long time and exchanged intimate pictures of each other. They then broke up and found themselves in new relationships. Alex shared some of Sam's intimate pictures with their new partner. Sam was angry when they found out. Is this power-based violence? 
yes, this is power-based violence and potentially an example of quote-unquote revenge porn. Alex shared intimate pictures of a former partner without the partner's consent. In our third scenario, an office manager has in their office a picture of a famous Renaissance painting that depicts several nude figures. A student visits the office manager and is very offended by the picture. Is this power-based violence? No, this is not power-based violence. While this may suggest poor judgment that may warrant a conversation between the office manager and their supervisor, there is no indication that there is a power imbalance or any suggestion that there is any intent to coerce, control, intimidate, or offend. And in our final scenario for this section, a graduate student who serves as a teaching assistant is holding office hours. One of the students in her class comes to visit and asks for guidance on a particularly difficult assignment. The graduate student says, you don't need to worry about your grade. All you need to do is take me out for dinner and see where the night takes us. Is this power-based violence? Yes, this is power-based violence. The graduate student, by virtue of her position as a teaching assistant, has power over her students. She is conditioning a good grade on participating in a personal relationship and attempting to coerce her student. Now that we've done a deep dive into what power-based violence is and isn't, it's time to discuss what your responsibilities as potential responsible employees are. As we'll talk about in a moment, the ultimate responsibility of a responsible employee is to report power-based violence. But first, let's talk about who is an employee under the law. The definition of employee includes an administrative officer, official, or employee of a post-secondary education board or institution, as well as anyone appointed by a public post-secondary education board or institution, anyone employed by or through a public post-secondary education board or institution, and anyone employed by a foundation or association related to a public post-secondary education board or institution. As you can see, the definition of employee casts a very wide net. It includes everyone, from maintenance employees, to administrative staff, to faculty, to chancellors, to board members, and everyone in between. The definition even extends to the foundations and associations related to our public post-secondary institutions. Often, students are also employees of our institutions. The law's definition of employee excludes these enrolled students unless they work in a position such as a teaching assistant or a residential advisor. As you can see, the examples listed indicate that the student, by virtue of the employment role, has some sort of authority over others. Teaching assistants can assign or influence grades of students. Residential advisors have authority over students who are living in on-campus dorms. These students are considered employees under this law and may have responsibilities for reporting power-based violence. Contrast this with a student who has a work-study job serving in the dining hall or reshelving books in the campus library, jobs that do not involve power or authority over other students. So now that we understand the very broad definition of the term employee, what then is a responsible employee? A quote unquote responsible employee is an employee who receives a direct statement regarding or witnesses an incident of power-based violence. There are some exceptions though. First, employees designated as confidential advisors those designated by an institution to provide emergency and ongoing support to students who are alleged victims of power-based violence are not considered quote-unquote responsible employees and therefore have no obligation under the law to report power-based violence. This makes sense. As our title implies, confidential advisors are intended to be a confidential resource for alleged victims. They would be unable to do their work if they could not maintain confidentiality and had to report information to others. Additionally, employees who have privileged communications with a student as provided by law are not considered quote unquote responsible employees and have no obligation under the law to report power-based violence. For instance, 
a medical doctor who must maintain patient confidentiality under the law would not have to report their patient's disclosure of power-based violence. Likewise, a mental health counselor who must maintain client confidentiality under the law would not have to report their client's disclosure of power-based violence. Now that we've discussed who a responsible employee is and is not, it's time for our second round of quizzes. In this section, you will be given three short scenarios and asked to determine whether the individual is a responsible employee. Like before, each is a yes-no question. Use your mouse to select what you believe is the correct answer, and after each scenario, you'll hear the correct answer. If you get any of these questions wrong, you'll need to rewatch the section discussing responsible employees before proceeding with the training module. Good luck. In our first scenario, a professor is visited by a student during office hours. The student discloses that he was assaulted by another professor in the department. In this case, is the professor a responsible employee? Yes, this professor is a responsible employee as an employee of the institution to whom a direct report of power-based violence was made. In our second scenario, a student visits the campus mental health clinic and signs up for counseling sessions. During the course of a counseling session, the student reveals that a professor made him perform sexual favors in exchange for a good grade in the class. Is the counselor a responsible employee? No, the counselor is not a responsible employee. Communications between mental health counselors and their clients are considered privileged by law. Because the disclosure was made in the course of a confidential communication, the counselor is not a responsible employee. Keep in mind that in certain rare instances, a counselor may break confidentiality, but there is no obligation for the counselor to report under this law. In our third and final scenario in this section, a student has a work-study job in the campus athletic center restocking towels. A fellow student discloses that she was sexually assaulted in the athletic center a few months before. Is the student who works in the athletic center a responsible employee? No, the student is not a responsible employee. The student, although serving as an employee of the institution, does not hold a job such as a teaching assistant or residential advisor that gives that student power or authority over other students. Now remember, just because this student was not a quote-unquote responsible employee under the law and did not have an obligation to report under the law, they could still choose to report it. So now we've discussed who falls into the category of responsible employee. And as we've already mentioned, the primary obligation of a responsible employee is to report power-based violence. Now let's discuss what reporting means and what it looks like. If a responsible employee receives a direct statement or witnesses an incident of power-based violence committed by or against a student, that responsible employee shall promptly report the incident to the institution's Title IX coordinator. Basically, if you're a responsible employee and you see an incident or receive a direct report of an incident of power-based violence involving a student, you must promptly report it to the Title IX coordinator. Likewise, if a responsible employee receives information about retaliation against any person for reporting power-based violence, that responsible employee shall promptly report the incident to the Title IX coordinator. Now pay attention to an important distinction. Responsible employees are required to report power-based violence committed by or against a student. By contrast, responsible employees are required to report retaliation against anyone, whether they are a student or an employee. A report needs to have some minimum detail to the extent known. A report should include the identity of the alleged victim, the identity of the alleged perpetrator, the type of power-based violence or retaliation alleged, and any other details about the incident, such as the location and date and time of the incident. Now, there are three important exceptions to this reporting requirement. First, 
no report is required if the information is learned through a public forum or awareness event in which an individual discloses an incident of power-based violence as part of educating others. For instance, remember that survivor testimony offered to the Louisiana legislature that we discussed near the beginning of this module? That would be the sort of public forum or awareness event contemplated. If you learn of power-based violence through such a forum, you are not obligated to report. Second, if disclosure is made in the course of academic work consistent with the assignment, you're not obligated to report it. For example, if a student makes a disclosure as part of a performance art piece for her art class and you learn about it that way, you're not obligated to report. Finally, if disclosure is made indirectly in the course of overhearing a conversation, you're not obligated to report it. For example, if you find yourself at a campus restaurant and overhear the next table discussing a personal experience of sexual assault on campus, you are not obligated to report it under the law. Bottom line though, if you witness an incident of power-based violence or if someone makes a direct disclosure to you, report it. You do not need to take on the burden of determining whether the disclosure is truthful or whether the alleged victim is credible. You should simply report it and the consequences of failing to meet that reporting obligation are serious. The law states that a responsible employee who is determined by the institution's disciplinary procedures to have knowingly failed to make a report or with the intent to harm or deceive made a report that is knowingly false shall be terminated, not suspended, not given a directive, but terminated. This is a serious consequence in keeping with the seriousness of the commitment to creating a culture of safety. So let's break this down. The institution must follow its usual disciplinary procedures before taking an employment action. But the import is clear. Knowingly failing to make a required report is a firing offense. Likewise, knowingly making a false report with the intent to harm or deceive is also a firing offense. At the end of the day, the message is clear. Institutions must devote their time and attention to intervening and addressing power-based violence. And those who interfere with that mission, whether it be by failing to report or whether it be by gumming up the works with false reports and improperly weaponizing the process, will face significant consequences. Given responsible employees' absolute obligations to report incidents of power-based violence, it's important that these same employees be protected from reprisal when they do so in good faith, and the law provides for that protection. The law states that an institution shall not discipline, discriminate, or otherwise retaliate against an employee or student who in good faith either makes a report of power-based violence as required by law, or who cooperates with an investigation, a disciplinary process, or a judicial proceeding relating to a report made by an employee or student as required by law. Of course, the law states that these protections do not apply to an employee or student who either reports an incident of power-based violence perpetrated by that employee or student, or who cooperates with an investigation, disciplinary process, or a judicial proceeding relating to an allegation that that employee or student perpetrated an incident of power-based violence. Essentially, those who confess their own misconduct or who participate in an investigative process regarding their own misconduct can be subject to discipline. Just as the law provides for protections against employment-related retaliation for making required reports in good faith, it also provides for immunity from civil and criminal liability. The law states that a person acting in good faith who reports or assists in the investigation of a report of an incident of power-based violence or who testifies or otherwise participates in a disciplinary process or judicial proceeding arising from a report of such an incident shall be immune from civil liability and from criminal liability that might otherwise be incurred or imposed as a result of those actions. Further, that individual may not be subject to any disciplinary action by the institution in which the person is enrolled or employed 
for any violation by that person of the institution's code of conduct that is reasonably related to the incident for which suspension or expulsion from the institution is not a possible punishment. Of course, these protections do not apply to those who perpetrate or who assist in perpetrating an incident of power-based violence. So essentially, those who report or assist with an investigation, provided they're acting in good faith and are not perpetrators, have civil and criminal immunity. Further, individuals who are not perpetrators may also have some disciplinary protections. Of course, and logically, none of these protections apply to perpetrators or those who assist in the perpetration of power-based violence. Now that we've covered reporting obligations, let's get to our final round of quizzes. In this section, you'll be given five short scenarios and asked to determine whether each scenario needs to be reported. As before, each is a yes-no question. Use your mouse to select what you believe is the correct answer, and after each scenario, you will hear the correct answer. If you get any of these five questions wrong, you will need to rewatch the section discussing reporting obligations before completing the final portion of this training module. Good luck. In our first scenario, a university board member is approached by a student. He tells the board member that he is being stalked by a professor at the university. He used to have a romantic relationship with the professor and then broke it off. Ever since, the professor has been showing up uninvited to his house, following him around campus, and sending him hundreds of texts a day. The student is terrified of the professor. Does the university board member need to report this? Yes, board members must report power-based violence. The scenario described by the student constitutes stalking and power-based violence and must be reported. In our second scenario, a college president attends a legislative hearing at which legislation affecting her college will be considered. During the hearing, a rape survivor tells a harrowing personal story of how she was raped on that campus and felt the entire campus community ignored it. Does the college president need to report this? No. Although the incident described would constitute power-based violence, because it was disclosed at a public forum, the college president is not required to report it. In our third scenario, a professor approaches one of her colleagues. She tells her colleague that the chair of the department has been sexually harassing her. Does this need to be reported? No. Remember that only instances of power-based violence committed by or against a student must be reported. Here, there are no students involved, so the colleague is not obligated to report it. That being said, while there is no obligation to report this under this law, remember that you could have a reporting obligation under Title IX or some other law. And even if you do not have any reporting obligation, the colleague can still report it to the Human Resources Department or elsewhere in an effort to stop the sexual harassment. In our fourth scenario, a college is conducting an investigation into a high-profile allegation of on-campus rape committed against a student by a beloved and powerful administrator. Other employees have been contacted by the investigator to participate in the investigation. One such employee sat for a long interview and told everything he knew, including some facts that point towards the administrator's guilt. It is suspected that this employee made the initial report. Shortly after that interview, the employee was demoted for no apparent reason. The employee tells his colleague about this and says it's retaliatory. Does this need to be reported? Yes, this must be reported. This appears to be retaliation against an employee for reporting power-based violence and participating in an investigation. Retaliation against anyone, student or employee, for reporting power-based violence must be reported. In our fifth and final scenario, for a creative writing assignment, a student hands in a story to her creative writing professor about a girl who was assaulted by her professor. During discussion of the story in a workshop, 
The student says it's an autobiographical story about something that happened to her within the last few months. Does this need to be reported? No. The disclosure was made as part of academic coursework consistent with an assignment given in the class. As you might imagine, making a report of power-based violence is no small thing. Remember that responsible employees are mandated reporters of power-based violence. But sometimes, someone may come to you to confide in you privately with no intention or desire for it to go any further. There are many understandable reasons for this, and you must balance their wishes with doing your duty under the law. So if someone begins to confide in you, you should let them know up front what your obligations are to report such instances. That way, they can make a knowing and informed decision and stay in control of their story. This is not to say that you should discourage people from disclosing to you, only that you should be upfront about what your obligations are. But what if they disclose anyway? Again, explain your mandatory duty to them so they know what to expect, but maintain confidentiality to the extent that you can. While you are obligated to report to the Title IX coordinator, you are not obligated to report to anyone else. The Title IX coordinator will likewise maintain privacy to the extent that they can, but they can't guarantee it. Certainly, during the course of an investigation, some details must be disclosed to others, such as to the alleged perpetrator. Finally, be supportive and don't judge the student. Surviving power-based violence or sexual misconduct can be a traumatizing experience, and trauma can show up in lots of ways, ways that might show up when someone discloses to you. Trauma can look like numbness, a matter-of-fact delivery of highly sensitive information, or it can look like anxiety, depression, anger, irritability, fear, guilt, or any combination of these at various times. Trauma can also lead to feelings of loss of control as well as physical manifestations, such as nausea, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, or sleep or appetite disturbances. Also be mindful that memories of traumatic events can be encoded differently in the brain than other memories. Survivor stories may not be told in a linear fashion the first, second, or even tenth time. It's not unusual for survivors to have gaps in their memories or gaps in their ability to recount details, and sometimes the complete picture presents itself only over time. This is not to say that all survivors are the same. Just as we're all different people with different skill sets, capacities, and experiences, so too are survivors. If someone comes to you to disclose an allegation of power-based violence, it's important to think about how you will respond. As we've already mentioned, it's important that you explain your mandatory reporting obligation. But beyond that, providing initial comfort and support can go a long way. For instance, you can say, thank you for telling me. After all, they've entrusted you with a recounting of their own vulnerability, which is no small thing. Let them know you're here to help, even if that help is reporting it so the matter can be investigated and addressed. Tell them you believe them, but only if you mean it, don't lie. Let them know that you're sorry they experienced this, that the most important thing is that they did what they had to do to keep going. Let them know there is help available and offer your own help to the extent of your capacity and willingness to provide it. Just as there are some examples of supportive responses, there are some things to stay away from. Stay away from making decisions for the survivor or second guessing their actions by telling them what they should have done or what you would have done in the same situation. Don't ask why questions. These can sound like you're blaming the survivor for what was done to them. Don't become an investigator. That's not your role. Don't threaten violence against the perpetrator. Often it seems like it's supportive to do that, to demonstrate that you believe the survivor and that you're committed to justice. But this response is focused on the perpetrator rather than the survivor and can easily become just one more heightened emotion for the survivor to manage. Don't compare traumas. There might be worse things that could have happened in your opinion, 
and perhaps you yourself have survived something traumatic, but maintain your focus on the person in front of you. Finally, do not break confidentiality unless you're obligated to report the incident by law. Here, we offer a three-step plan on how to respond to disclosures of power-based violence. First, exhibit care. After all, you have in front of you a human being who is sharing an experience of vulnerability. Listen to them without judgment. Avoid questions that imply fault, like those why questions. Offer your support, but don't investigate. Gently interrupt if necessary to let them know you're obligated to report and let them know that you're going to contact the institution's Title IX coordinator. For step two, connect the individual with relevant campus and community resources, which we'll talk about in a moment. And finally, step three, promptly contact the Title IX coordinator at your institution and report the incident. Share all the details that you have and leave nothing out and let the student know that they can expect a contact from the Title IX office. Our campus and wider communities often offer valuable resources for survivors, and you can connect the individual with some or all of these resources. For instance, campuses and community organizations may offer counseling and campus mental health resources. Additionally, each institution designates confidential advisors specifically to assist alleged victims. There may be victim and survivor advocacy organizations on campus and in the community that can provide additional supportive services, including 24-hour hotlines. If the individual might need legal support, many communities have legal aid organizations that can provide low-cost or no-cost legal services. Finally, many campuses and communities have community education and outreach organizations that can themselves connect alleged victims with additional resources. One potential resource is law enforcement, but please be mindful about contacting law enforcement. There is no obligation for adult survivors to report their own experiences to law enforcement, and there are many reasons why a survivor of power-based violence will never report to law enforcement, even when it's clearly a crime. The law enforcement process can be overwhelming and re-traumatizing to survivors. So often, survivors are less interested in seeking the law's version of justice, an arrest, a conviction, someone sent to jail, than they are in just protecting their own safety, regardless of what happens to a perpetrator. Investigations can be lengthy and result in no arrest, but that doesn't mean a crime didn't happen. So while you're not prohibited from contacting law enforcement, we recommend that you do not report to law enforcement on a student's behalf without their involvement and consent. There may be other officials within the institution who are obligated to involve law enforcement in some capacity, but your only legal obligation is to report to the Title IX office. Thank you for watching and completing this training module. The Louisiana Board of Regents is committed to providing a safe and affirming campus experience for all students who attend our public colleges and universities and to creating a culture of safety where all students can excel and thrive. Thank you for doing your part in making this culture a reality.